Hallelujah sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise his name I'm fixed upon The name of God's redeeming love Hitherto thy love has blessed me Hey everybody, welcome to the American Campfire Revival. It's great to be with you here tonight, and uh, it's been a been a really great day today. My kids came home from being out of town for a little for a little while, and um, been out here after going to church with some good friends and had some lunch, and just had a great time to talk about what's important and to talk about the future, talk about our faith, talk about our family, talk about our our country and where we're headed and what we can do to make a difference. And uh, it was just such a great and refreshing reminder that finding your tribe and your people, finding time to spend with the family of faith is one of the things that we were made for. Because there's a, there's a, a hardening of our heart and there is a downward degradation toward hopelessness and despair if all we do is look at what's happening around us because there seems to be an increase of darkness in the general public culture here in the United States of America, and it can be depressing and strip us of hope. And we need to be regularly reminded by the family of faith and by the Word of God, which fuels our faith, that there's a bigger story that's going on. And the author of that story has secured absolute victory and triumph over evil so that we don't need to be driven by fear. We can be fueled by faith, which when we believe the promises of God, it produces joy. And that's what we're going to be celebrating today on the American Campfire Revival because we know where our hope hope comes from. It comes from the family of faith responding to the good God of heaven and applying his principles to all of life. And it's all made possible because God reconciled us to himself through the blood and the body of his son Jesus on the cross. And that's what we celebrate and those are the, those are the, the great truths that we're reminded of today, Sunday, the Lord's Day. So uh, let's, let's gather and let's pray uh, as we have a little bit of church right here in my backyard and in your living room or wherever it is that you're watching from. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful day. I uh, ask for your blessing on my brothers and sisters. Lord, you know the, the challenges, you know the heartaches, you know the broken dreams, and you know the things that keep us awake at night. You know the things that cause us fear the source of our worry and anxiety. Lord, you understand how we're so easily manipulated by doubt and uncertainty, especially when we're walking by sight rather than by faith in your promises. So God, would you please give us what we need? Teach us what we don't know. Help us see what we've been blind to. And give us ears to hear your word today. And most of all, Lord, give us a pure heart. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, it's been uh, a couple of days since, since we've talked. And, and I was reading this morning before we went to church in a passage in uh, First Chronicles. And I just happened to open up to it. And I wanted to share it with you because I just uh, it reminded me of everything that I want for our country and everything that I want for my family. And I better reflect your heart too. And it's the prayer of a father named King David. He was also a political ruler. He was the king of Israel. And toward the very end of his life, he had amassed all the things needed for the, for the building of a temple for God. And this was going to be a job that his son was going to have to finish because he was too old and he was not going to be able to do it. And listen to what he said. He said, Oh Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house 
for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. What I, what I love about his acknowledgement is something that Abraham Lincoln later said in our country, that it is critical that to David, that he recognized that all this that he had amassed, all of the gold, all of the timber, all of the stone, all of the resources needed to do a good thing for God, to do a good thing for his country, he recognized he didn't create it, he didn't make it, it was all something that God had already made and he was using what belonged to his creator that he was wanting to serve. And ultimately he brings nothing to the table. He, he, he's in the humble position of acknowledging that God is the source even of the gifts that he brings to God. And Abraham Lincoln said that about us in our country. He recognized that there would be a tendency for us to think that our success and prosperity and the ability to be a blessing to other people somehow would come from the greatness that we have created within ourselves. And he said, that's not true. Everything we have comes originally as a gift from the Almighty. And King David goes on to say, I know also, God, that you test the heart and you have pleasure in uprightness. I love that David understands that God sees things differently than you and I tend to see things. Man looks at the outward appearance and gets all excited about the Academy Awards and the Oscars and who's got what dress on and who's, who, 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 uh, you know, fired off the slap that was heard round the world. I, I don't think God is wrapped up in, in headlines on tabloids. God is concerned about the heart and David knew it. David was actually chosen by God because of his heart. God said that David was a man after God's own heart. Jesus said the pure in heart will see God. And then David goes on to say, in the uprightness of my heart, he said, I have willingly offered all of these things to you and with joy I see my people offering these things to you. They were going to build him a temple. And that's what I want is a pure heart. That's what I'm praying for for you is that God gives you a pure heart, which means he's going to have to purge the filthiness and the impurities and the pollution within my heart and within your heart. And that often takes fire, testing, trials, pressure, and pain. But it's good because it pushes the impurities out and leaves remaining only that which is pure. And that's what I want in my heart because God's going to test it and he's going to test yours. And that's what he's looking for. And then David goes on to say, Oh God, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people. Keep the intent of the thoughts of their heart. It's from your heart come your thoughts. In, 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 in Israel and in, in Hebrew, they're not talking about the organ that pumps blood. They're talking about the heart of you, the center of you, the command station from which good and evil flows. It's the storage place of wickedness and uprightness. What's inside of your heart? And he said, God, fix my people's heart upon you. And that's my prayer, God. I need you to pin my heart pointed toward you in purity, in uprightness. And God, fix the direction of people's hearts toward heaven in our country. I want to pray like David. I want what David wants. And he said, and give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commands. I want that for my, my sons and my daughters. God, please give my kids a loyal heart to keep your commands because I know they lead toward blessing. And even more than my kids' blessing, 
it will bring you joy and pleasure, God, when they are following your ways. At the end of the day, and this was said in church this morning, I'm not the main character in the story. It's not like in Hollywood or in a movie where I get to play the lead character. The lead character is Jesus. The hero in the story is the one who laid down his life on the cross. I am a small supporting character in only a couple of scenes in the big story. Our kids are not the main characters in the story. They're often at front and center in our minds but our kids need to understand that they're not the main character. God is the main character. And what he desires is for them to have a pure heart, a loyal heart. And that's what we pray for, so that God will be pleased with them. And yes, it will also lead to their blessing. Oh God, please fix the direction of my heart, my kid's heart, and our nation's heart toward you. And then and only then will our families begin to heal. Only when our heart is fixed toward God will our religion actually reflect the goodness of heaven, not the hypocrisy of hell. And only when our heart is pure and loyal as a nation which begins with our hearts pure as individuals, only then will our civil government and politics be pleasing in the eyes of God and a blessing to us as people. Until then, politics is a joke. It's a fraud. Religion is something that people want nothing to do with and God will vomit out of his mouth when it's hypocritical and the people who are praying fail to have a pure heart and love their neighbor as themselves. There's nothing more disgusting and repulsive than a religious hypocrite. Am I wrong? How offensive is it when a, when, a, when, a, when a religious leader reveals himself to be a fake and has abused and taken advantage of other people in the pursuit of their own pleasure. And marriages and families fall apart without loyalty and a pure heart rather than flourishing like they're supposed to. And so I love King David's heart. I love how he prays for his son to have a, a loyal heart and for his people to continue to fix their heart toward God. Well, I had mentioned to you that uh, we would have communion on the story earlier uh, here in, at, uh, on Facebook. And so if you have something with which to symbolize the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus and you want to partake of communion with me, uh, I'd love to do that and lead you through this. As you know, uh, on that last, that last night, Jesus gathered with his disciples in, a, in an upper room, in a private room, and they had, they had a Passover meal. And while they were there, no doubt they were talking about the covenant that God had made with his people. And as they were breaking bread, Jesus said, this bread is a symbol of my body, my body which will be broken for you. And of course, they weren't exactly sure what he was talking about, but very quickly they would understand that he was referring to his broken body on the cross when he was crucified, when he was arrested. He was falsely convicted and he was then murdered. And because of his broken body on the cross, they would find new life because the penalty for sin would be dealt out in full upon Jesus's flesh on that wooden pole that he was pinned to. So let's take the bread in remembrance of Jesus.
the Bible says that he also took the cup and he took the wine and referred to it as the symbol of his blood. The blood that would ratify and seal the new covenant that God would make with his people in the blood of Jesus. Rather than sacrificing a lamb or a bull or some other animal and the blood being shed and the body being broken, Jesus said, this is going to be my body and my blood that's going to be shed once and for all. And this will provide forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life for those who come to me by faith. So let's uh, drink the wine together in remembrance of Jesus' spilled blood on the cross. It's good wine too. <clears throat> God tells us in his word that the way we react to the promises of God, either we're, we're, it, they, the promises of God break us in humility and we're filled with gratitude at the kindness and mercy of God that he sent his son to die on the cross and shed his blood so that we could be forgiven of our sins, our offenses, our wickedness, and our rebellion. If we have that kind of reaction, it tells us whether or not we have a pure heart before God. But if we react to the idea that someone had to die, someone's body had to be sh shredded and broken in order for you to be made right with God because you're guilty of wickedness and rebellion and selfishness and pride, if that, re if that repels you, that tells you something of the contents of your heart. Listen to what God says in his word, and this will demonstrate it for you. How do you react to this? He says in the book of Isaiah, the prophet said to the people, come now and let us reason together. Come, just come sit at the table with me. Come Come sit with me and let's reason together. Let's talk this out. I see your heart. And he says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. There's scarlet. There's crimson. This is the color of blood. Blood is a symbol of death. Life is in the blood, God tells us, and when blood is spilled, that's symbolic of death. Your sin and mine, according to the word of God, produces death, and it is as red as scarlet, it is as crimson as this wine. But if we will come to God in faith and put our trust in the one who shed his blood on the cross, he'll make our blood red, death soaked heart white as snow. He'll take it from red and turn it white. He'll make it from crimson to the color of white wool washed, purified, and cleansed. And that's how we get that pure heart that David had. That's how we get that loyal heart that Solomon was going to receive because of David's prayer. That's how we see God is with a pure heart, not because we're pure in ourselves. We've come to God with a filthy heart and we've said, God, forgive me. Change my heart. I want to follow you in faith. I want to put away my wicked ways and I want to fix my heart toward you. Make me upright and pure and loyal inside. And then let me walk that out in my family. 
with my kids and my spouse. Let me walk that out in my church, in my faith, and not be a hypocrite. And let me walk that out in the way I engage in culture and not be a wuss who, who backs out of, of engaging in public policy discussions and getting involved in the political civil leadership process because whining, complaining members of the family of faith who cry about what's happening in the world but fail to get involved miss the entire point and strategy of why God saved you. It's so that you would be an effective light in the darkness. Not a light who complains about the darkness, but so that we would be salt in the world, preserving what is good and holding back the decaying and the rotting of culture, bringing heaven to earth by God's power working through us as we permeate the culture and penetrate the darkness rather than retreating and hiding, waiting for the great escape. We are to advance, not retreat. Because the gospel has victory written all over it. And it was secured and purchased by the body and blood of the King of Kings, who said all authority in heaven and on earth was given to me. Now go, he said, into all the world and teach all nations to obey what I've commanded you. Disciple all nations. Not tuck your head between your knees and wait to get out of here. Go teach them, preach the gospel. And he said, I will be with you, the one with all authority over the devil, over every power on earth and every angel in heaven, he's with us. Victory is sure. Covenant keepers win, covenant breakers lose. We just have to stay around long enough to see the end of the story. Well, God bless you guys. I hope you have a great rest of the night and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, Got some special stuff planned to, to share with you. And uh, don't forget to check out our website at AmericanCampfireRevival.com. Let's see, AmericanCampfireRevival.com. I don't know what's going on here, but my, there we go. My computer is kind of uh, going a little nuts here. But uh, we've got all sorts of things like these pray sweatshirts and t-shirts and hats and, and uh, books and training courses and everything else. Uh, along with an opportunity for you to share your prayer requests for us. And my mom would love to pray for you. Send your comments on Facebook. I'm going to be reading those now. I'm going to respond back to some of you. I want to hear what's going on. I want to hear how your campfires are doing. And I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow night.